cabinet, the church council has decided to adopt a, a community, a family in the community. Okay, and um, it's a big family, and they need a lot. They're very, they're a very poor family. Um, what we've done, or what Marriott's done, is put together a sign-up sheet like that, and you can sign up for to take one of the children. And then if you take one of the children, she has a, a second sheet to kind of like lists out what that child needs. Mary, can you, you want to, you want to clarify that? They just their wishes. Their wishes, okay. And the interesting yeah. thing is H1 wanted a blanket to keep warm. Yeah, that was pretty touching when we heard they all needed blankets. So for a child to ask for a blanket, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a need there. Okay, so there's seven children. They range from uh, four-month-old twins to age 12. Uh, Glenn went and visited them this week. Um, he, he was very, very impressed. The kids were really polite. They were very gracious, very grateful for just even being considered. So it's uh, very heartwarming just to hear, all that, hear his story about them. <clears throat> okay, so you'll see the sign-up sheet. We'll put it in the back. Um, and we want to get collected all by December the 18th. Okay, so just kind of circle that day. And, um, there's going to be a new church, a new couple joining the church on December the 4th. So uh, definitely be here for that. Um, if you, uh, if any of y'all been thinking about joining, if there's some of you out here, I see some new faces. I see some regular faces that maybe not make members yet. Um, talk to someone in the council. Talk to the pastor. You know, we'd love to have you. You know, this, this family's got room for more. Um, there's not going to be a covered dish birthday dinner lunch luncheon today. Um, uh, I know Debbie and I have had Thanksgiving for the last few days in a row. We don't want another meal. You know, I, I, I can't eat another thing. I, I hope I never see another turkey again the rest of the year. Um, Until next year. Next year. Until Christmas. So I, I hope that I'm going to break that in a few weeks. Um, the nativity scene and the Christmas decoration is going to go up next Saturday. So. Uh, be ready for that. All hands on deck. Everybody, everybody's got. There's a job for everybody, you know, because we need garlands up there. We need a tree up here. We got a nativity scene out there. There's a lot to do. Uh, plenty, plenty of things for everybody. Um, the ladies' Christmas party at Shoals Restaurant in Columbus is on Thursday, December the eighth. Um, all ladies of the church are invited. On Sunday, December the eleventh. Uh, the Columbus Community Choir will be presenting We Needed a King at the Columbus High School. Um, they've been doing this for a while. This is a really cool program. If y'all are looking for Christmas programs to go to, this is kind of like one of the first ones. So check that out. Um, it's at Columbus High School. <clears throat> All right, the candlelight service is coming up. Um, the Christmas program for the children will be on the Sunday, December the 18th, and so will the candlelight service. It'll be that day, too. Um, if you have a child who would like to participate, see this young lady right here, Marriott Bellamy. Um, she'll organize all that. Uh, Christmas Eve candlelight service is on Saturday, December the 24th at 6 o'clock. Um, the other one was at 6 o'clock also. And then Jan Sunday, January the 8th, we're going to kind of getting way out here. It will be casual Sunday. We're going to take down all the stuff that we just put up. <clears throat> Got a couple of prayers in the prayer list. You might have some too. Uh, Russell Conrad's dad, Roland, um, has COVID. So we, he needs our prayers. And uh, Nell Moser's daughter-in-law, Lisa Moser, is in ICU with pneumonia. So that might be it. Did I forget anything? Anybody? Oh, here we go. Oh, that's a big deal. Okay. All right. Do you have a goal or anything? <laughs> do, you have, do you have a goal? How many should we plan on selling? We need like 30, mm -hmm. no more than about 32. Okay. All right, cool. That's a, that's a pretty easy target. We're not quite there yet. All right. Can we vote our ship? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> any other announcements? Okay, well, then I'm going to ask you all to rise. And um, we will sing our opening hymn, which is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 168.
Join me in the responsive reading, call of worship. Uh, in Advent, we celebrate God's gift of a new beginning. We praise our God for new beginnings, for turning our despair into hope. We praise our God who created the heavens and the earth, brought order to chaos, turned darkness into light, and breathed life into each of us. Today we bear witness to the word and the light that was with God in the beginning and became flesh in Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns in us and through us now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We are blessed this morning to light the first candle on our Advent wreath, and so we'll invite our family to come forward. Uh, Emily Gossip and, and uh, Gossip, I'm sorry, and Tyler Rapp, come on up and take care of it for us, please. Thank you. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of peace. We light it knowing full well that peace is elusive, and in some parts of the world, it is almost completely absent. Yet in this season of Advent, we trust that God is never absent from us. God is always preparing something new. And even when there is war and discord, whether between countries, within families, or within our hearts, God is present, gently leading us to new possibilities. Pray with me. Dear God of the prophets, give us this day the prophetic word of hope that in the moments of despair we might look to you for comfort. We give you thanks for all the prophets, past and present. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning, one and all. Good morning. Oh, that's better. Good. I am so glad to see everyone here today on this beautiful Sunday morning, and I ask that God blesses the hundreds of us who have gathered here in this place, and the thousands will be watching us over the internet in the days ahead. Amen. 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 Smiles of concern. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, how many of you have recovered from Thanksgiving? You know, one of the things, some of you raised your hand, how many of you are ready to move on from Thanksgiving? You know, uh, Thanksgiving, it's, it's, it's one of those times of the year that, uh, that we have the opportunity to give thanks. You know the best way to give thanks? Is by giving. And what I heard this morning is, as, as this church is getting ready to adopt a family, and I know you have your, uh, your Christmas boxes and your food pantry, I mean, this is a very, very giving community of faith. And I praise God that we have the opportunity to be together in these times. And I just, uh, I just continue to pray for you that, that your hearts continue to remain open to, to the community and to the world at large. Because remember, Thanksgiving is about giving thanks by giving. The second thing is we are now entering the season of Advent as we have our first candle has, has been lighted. Uh, and it is a time for hope and peace and love and joy. And it is my hope that in the next four weeks, you find and experience those things abundantly. And the last thing I want to share with you is that sometime during the service, you're going to hear a whistle blast. I don't know when that's going to take place. All I am saying is be ready, because at any point in time, today, during the service, that can happen. Okay? You with me? Once I read the text this morning, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Well, hopefully you'll understand what I'm talking about. I hope I understand what I'm talking about most of the time. But at some point during the service, so just be ready for when it comes. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessing of worship, the opportunity to come together at this place, at this time, with, with our friends and our families and our neighbors. And we just ask, that you continue to bless all that we do, that you continue to, to open our hearts to those in need, 
as you have blessed us, I ask that you continue to allow us to bless others. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to invite our children to come up. Hi, how y'all doing? Good, Woo, look at you. How was Thanksgiving? Did you have a good time? Did you eat a lot? You did, okay, me too. But uh, that's why I wear sweaters, you can't tell how much I ate. Yeah, all right. Well, you know what happens in four weeks from today? Christmas. Yes, ma'am. Christmas Day is only four weeks away. And are you ready for it? How are you getting ready? Did you put up decorations yet? A little. A little. Okay. I see one head shaking. No. I see it a little bit. Okay. Uh, have you started your cooking and your baking? Baking? No? No, I like cookies. So when you're baking, <laughs> cookies, cookies, cookies. <laughs> Actually, I like all desserts, so it's okay. But this is a time over the next four weeks that we start getting ready for Christmas. And that's when we celebrate Jesus coming into the world to be with us and to teach us and, and to show us how to live a good life and the right life. It's, it's really an exciting time. But for the next four weeks, there's a lot of preparing that's going to take place. You're going to see it in your schools when people put in up decorations. You're going to see it in the community. You're going to see it all over the place, people getting ready for Christmas. But what's important is that you get yourself ready for Christmas, too. And how do you get yourself ready? Well, you've already started by coming to church today. That's a pretty good start, isn't it? You love coming here, don't you? Yeah, okay, me too. I, I have a good time here. And you can also do things like pray. Yeah, you pray for your parents and your grandparents. You pray for your brother. You pray for your sister. Work with me on this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we pray for each other because that's what we do. And we just show our love for other people. So what you can do is maybe if you're thinking of Christmas gifts to give to your parents or your grandparents or friends, is you can give a little coupon that says, I will help put up Christmas decorations. Or I will help with cooking. Or I will help with cleaning my bedroom. Do you clean? Is your bedroom clean? Your beds are... You are so honest. I love it. It's been great. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you can put a coupon and you can give that to your mom or, or your grandparents or, or, or I promise you can give a coupon to a friend and say, I'll pray for you today. Okay? There's a lot of things you can do as we prepare for Christmas. So think, look, keep your eyes open, keep looking and say, oh, how can I help somebody today? Okay? Let's pray. Loving God, we're so excited that Christmas is coming. But it's not just a time when, when we receive gifts. It's not just a time when we, when we remember that, that you gave us the best gift of all through your son Jesus. But it's also a great time for us to remember that we can give gifts too. So help us to keep our eyes open and to stay alert so that we can help others who need our help. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. It's good to see you all. I want to clarify something I said earlier. We're not having the fourth Sunday luncheon today, but we still want everybody to come back to the fellowship hall and have a cup of coffee and do some fellowship time. No, okay. no, don't look, because what's left, I'm just so, so, you, so, you, so you need to at least pray over the snacks. Okay. <laughs> okay, whatever. Okay, um, if you would please rise, we're going to have another hymn, and it's called Joy to the World. I, I bet a few of you have heard this before. 171.
and join me in the prayer of confession. We confess, O oh God, that we do not take seriously your coming into our lives. We do not believe that salvation is near. We do not act upright, loving you, our neighbors, ourselves, nor do we bend our swords and spears. Forgive us, we pray, that we might once again walk in your light, choosing for the world our Christ. Amen. We are all sinners, and yet we are all loved in God's eyes. When we confess our sins and we lift up our hearts and put our lives in Christ's hands, we know that we are forgiven. Be assured, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven in Christ's name. Amen. Let's, let's confess our common uh, confession of faith as you find it in the Apostles' Creed, found on page 137 in your hymnal. I believe, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the spirit and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, let me read to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the floods, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about the flood that came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken up and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together and one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have let the uh, uh, not, uh, not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord given to God's people. Thanks be to God. Pray with me if you will. Almighty and gracious God, sometimes we, we hear your word and it's like a light goes off and we understand it immediately. And then there's times we hear your word and we wonder, just what are you trying to tell us? So this morning I ask, if you have not opened our eyes, and our ears to see and hear what you have in store for us. I ask that you open them now. I ask that you open my ears to continue to hear your word and that you continue to open my eyes that I'm able to see what is before me and that you continue to open my mind and my heart to continue to do your will. And may the words that I speak and the meditations that rest upon our, our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. SMU, Southern Methodist University, used to have a program. I don't know if they still do or not, but when I was going there for my Master of Divinity, can you believe I have mastered being divine? <laughs> you promised me you were going to chortle. I mean, you, 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 Warren never lets me down. I love it. He never lets me down. So, so if you're wondering what a Master of Divinity looks like, I'm probably not your guy. But anyway, anyway, uh, when we were there, they had a class for all incoming freshmen were required to take a class 
uh, that would help acclimate them to college life because you know they're coming from from home and family to to a new environment uh, and it also helped them to develop study skills. That was really the, the importance of, of the program. And, and they had these mandatory classes for all, all uh, incoming freshmen. And the, the, the classes were very, very helpful for a lot of these students. And, and some of them developed study skills that, that they never knew that they needed before. But, but SMU really wanted their, their students to succeed. Now, the classes were open to all incoming freshmen, but it, they were also open to upperclassmen and women who were coming in. It was also open to people who might be going for an MBA or a Master of uh, Theology or Divinity or uh, even law school. If you wanted to go to one of these classes, there was a list put out as to what they would be talking about on, on a particular day. And so the students took these classes and, uh, and, and went, and they didn't pay for them. Uh, they were required to go, and they, uh, they didn't get credit for it. But it really helped a lot of students. And, and we had one of our professors really was very enamored by one of the classes. It was called How to Read a Book. How to Read a Book. Now, you would think anybody going to college knows how to read a book. But, you know, we all have different ways. We all have different skills and everything. And, and they even had, this, uh, this is what I enjoyed, they even had a book entitled How to Read a Book. You see the irony there, right? They have given you a book on how to do something that you don't know how to do because you don't know how to read a book. But they had this book on how to read a book, and this one professor was, was really enjoyed it. And, and, and what he did, particularly in certain subject matters, theology being one of them, is, is, is this professor said, okay, the way you read these books is read the introduction or the preface, because in there, somewhere, it's gonna tell you why this book was written. Sometimes it's absolutely uh, 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 overt. The purpose of this book is, or the reason I'm writing this is, and then you can underline, okay, what is the point of what I'm gonna be reading? And I promise you, there were a lot of books on theology, I wondered exactly what is the point of this, but, you know, that's, that's a story for a different day. But anyway, uh, you, you read that, and, and you find out why this author has written the book. What, what journey is he or she going to take us on? And then he told us, read the first chapter, which will explain what they want to do. And then you read the last chapter, which explains what they've done, you know, sums everything up. And then that gives you the good precursor for reading through the rest of the book. And it helps fill in some of the blanks you might have. Now, I thought, you know, and, and, and I did that. And even if you're reading a chapter, read the first paragraph tells you where the author wants to go. Read the last paragraph, tells you where the author took you, and then you read the rest of the chapter, and, and it gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on. It was really a good study method, and, and I've used it many times. But one thing I've noticed is, uh, and now that uh, you know, I, I, I only preach usually once a month or so, and so I have a lot of time for pleasure reading. And so I enjoy different novels or mysteries or whatever it may be. And I've noticed that, that reading the first chapter of a mystery novel and reading the last chapter is less than satisfying. Because I want to take that journey in the book. And I, and I want to be there as the author that kind of uh, opens up the onion for me and, 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 and helps me get to the core of it. I, I, I like to do that. And so, and so like, how many of you have ever watched a movie on TV, uh, maybe on a DVD, so you play that first 10 minutes of the movie? And then you play that last 10 minutes of the movie. Well, now we know who done it. So it's like, why bother watching the rest of this silly thing? And so, you know, when, when, when we talk about uh, seeing what's going on, sometimes uh, we, we just don't want to start at the end. We want to we wanna, we wanna start at the beginning and work our way through to the end and, and, and enjoy the journey with the author or the, the, the director of the movie or, or whatever the event may be. Well, today is our first Sunday in Advent. So we are beginning the, this season of Advent, which comes from the, the Middle Latin Adventus, and it means to come or coming. It also means the arrival. And so what's happening here in, 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 our, in our first uh, text today is we are in fact starting at the end. If you remember the text I read, what Jesus is saying is we don't know when it's going to end. All we know is it's going to end. I don't know 
Only God knows. The angels don't know. Only God knows. But but there's going to be an end coming. And so so we start Advent with, with knowing that, that things are going to end at some point in time, but we just don't know when. Now, this kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you've ever written a book, or you've ever built a building, or whatever it may be, you start with the end in mind. Okay, you start with your plans. If you're writing a book, you write that outline. Remember when you learned that in, in, in high school English class, how to, how to put together an outline and, and then fill it in and do all that kind of silly stuff? Or, or if, you're, if you're building a building, uh, I, I remember when we were up in uh, Bryan, we built a, a facility to, to worship in. And, and I remember we, we had an architect put together the plans. We sat down with, with him and, and he spent hours and came up with all the plans as to what we wanted and what, it, what we wanted it to look like. And lo and behold, when the building was done, it looked like that. So we started with the end in mind. And, and so that, that's what we're doing today as we, as we begin Advent, we're starting uh, at the end, we're starting with the end in mind. Now, in our text this morning, we find Jesus is with his disciples because he knows his time on earth is coming to an end. He recognizes this and he sees this. And, and, and what, what Jesus is doing is, 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 is letting his disciples know, as we find out from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, for everything there is a season. He realizes his season on earth. With, with the people who he loves and who have loved him, he knows this season is about to end. But he also, as he tells his disciples, you know, all things do come to an end. He says, but no one knows. No one knows when it's going to happen. Now, some of you probably are thinking, well, yeah, there, there have been these guys, and there have been, uh, there, there have been hundreds of people who have uh, convinced thousands of people that they know the exact day, they know the exact time, sell all your goods, bring your money to me, and we're going to stand on this mountaintop somewhere and wait for the end to come. And they become incredibly disillusioned because as you're standing on that mountain and they see the sun come up and they wait, they wait, and they wait. <laughs> You never knew it was coming. You knew it was coming, but you didn't know when, did you? And Gwen knew. I didn't know. We talked about it, but I didn't know. But people wait and wait and wait and suddenly become disillusioned because as the sun has gone up in the morning, the sun sets in the evening, and by golly, the world is still there. And so what some of these shucksters have said is, well, you know what, I've got your money uh, and all your goods, but come back, I, I'm going to recalculate the dates and the times and all of this other stuff. So anytime someone comes up to you and says, I know when, just remember, Jesus said even he didn't know, even the angels didn't know, only God, our creator knows the end. And he even goes on uh, to, to, to give us the story about Noah. You know, with Noah, we, people are living their lives. They're doing what they do. Every day type of stuff is going on. Uh, and then suddenly there's the flood. And you have to imagine what it was like for Noah's neighbors to see him building this ark in the middle of a desert in his backyard. People thought he was nuts. He knew that God had told him something was going to happen, but he didn't know the date or the time. All he knew is something's going to happen. And, and the neighbors, they're living their lives, they're doing what they do, but he was out building his ark. But Noah did not wait for the rain to start before he started building his ark. He started way, way, way ahead of, ahead of time as God told him, this is what needs to happen. What we have in this kind of text is what's called apocryphal uh, literature. Apocalyptic literature. It, it talks about the end times. But here's something I want to I want you to think about a little bit. It does not necessarily mean the end of the world as we know it. It does not necessarily mean that, that the earth is going to be destroyed as it was in the flood by, by whatever other means. Uh, it, it means that the Son of Man is going to come. The advent is going to come. He will be here. He will be with us. 
But it also means that this is something that's very personal for each and every one of us. I, I've, I've told you about a colleague in ministry in, in another uh, community I was in, and he was really into this apocalyptic literature, the end times. And so uh, <laughs> he, he and his church were going through a study of the revelation of John during Advent, and I asked him why. I uh, said, so, you know, well, why would you do that? And, and I can see some, some reason for it. But he was really sold on this end times and people could predict it and all that. And, and he and I talked about that. And I said, but if, if I read the Bible correctly, it says that we don't know those things. Only God knows those things. And, and Don and I used to have some really uh, spirited discussions about these stuff. But he's studying this at, at, at Christmas time. And so we were getting ready, our, our community had gathered for our, our big Christmas uh, pageant and, and party and, and gathering and worship and all that kind of stuff. Was, we always had a, a great time doing that right before Christmas. And, and Don comes up to me as we're sitting there, and I'm just kind of looking, just making sure everything's there. And he comes up to me, he says, hey, t -Wolf, do you believe? that the world's going to end this way, this way, this way, this way, and, and he's going on and on. It's going to be a global event and everything else. I, and he said, do you believe that? I said, not for a second. And he looked at me. What do you mean? The Bible says that's how it's going to be. I said, no, that's an interpretation. That's not really what the Bible does. So, because, see, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says no one knows. So I started asking him a question. I said, uh, where is this going to happen? Now, sometimes when people have, have, have certain levels of theology, sometimes questions can really throw them, a, throw them for a loop. So I said, where's this going to happen? And he kind of looked at me. Jerusalem. Okay, okay, it's going to be Jerusalem. So how will everybody in the world at one time know that this is going to happen in Jerusalem? Well, you know, they'll tell them on TV. They'll tell them on the radio. How will they tell them? Nobody knows. The scripture tells us, no, but how will they do this? How will they communicate it? How will, uh, you mean the whole world will go to Jerusalem to see this happen? So we, we had a, a very, uh, uh, very good discussion. And as, as we ended things, I told him, I said, here's how I look at it. I look at this text as being a very, very personal event. We are with someone and they pass. And so one is lifted up to the next kingdom, and we stay behind. It doesn't mean we're sinners, it just means it's not our time to move on yet. Now, we might not know the time, but God does. The angels might not know our time, but God does. So this, to me, is a very personal event. And one day, each and every one of us will pass. And when we pass, there will be people left behind. Others will stay. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that this is the natural order of things. For everything, Ecclesiastes tells us, there is a season. A season to be born and a season to die. We will all experience those seasons. But between birth and our rebirth in the new world, so many things can happen. We will be on a journey. We, we, we will travel through this life with people doing things. And here's the thing. Uh, I, I've noticed this many times when uh, I talk to somebody who's been on a vacation, they never tell me about the day they left or the day they came back. They tell us about the experiences in between. And Gwen and I do that. When we go someplace, you know, people will say, well, you know, what was it like? And we'll tell them, we, we went here, we went there. We, we don't say, well, on such and such a date, we got on an airplane and we did this and we did that. People don't care about that. And, and, you know, and on this day, we, we got off the airplane and we were home. And blah, blah. But people don't care about that. Tell us about the journey. Because, see, that's what life is about. Life is about the journey. And so then we end up with uh, uh, what, what a lot of uh, pastors have called rapture. Do you know where to find rapture in the Bible? It ain't there. It is a concept, and rapture itself is an incredibly wonderful word. The, the word rapture comes from raptura, again, a middle Latin term. It talks about great, uh, the state of great joy, of ecstasy, of love, and to me, that is that personal experience of being with Christ. It describes how we take our last breath in this world, and we take our next breath, understanding the full love, 
peace, hope, and joy that Christ has given us in this life. And here's what it looks like. John tells us this in, in, in the Revelation to John. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the, and the first earth, they passed away. And the sea was no more. Now, sea typically re re revealed, uh, uh, referred to the confusion of life. Okay, that, When they talk about the sea, they talk about the chaos and the confusion. That sea no, 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 exists no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. That happens to each and every one of us is, is my belief that, that we pass our last breath here, our next breath in the new world, that's what we will experience. You know, sometimes we wonder uh, what, 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 how do we live our lives and, and how do we prepare for the future and then God in his infinite wisdom gives us this picture. I think this is just, just really, really wonderful stuff. But it, so it describes it, but, but here's the key to the text. The key to this text be ready. Be ready. How many of you were involved in scouting growing up or as adults? Okay, what's the motto? Be prepared. Be prepared. And, and, and I kid people about, you know, this be prepared thing really screwed me up as a kid because I like to be prepared for things. Some of you may say, really? I would have never known. But I, I like to be prepared for things. So, so when we talk about that, the motto of be prepared, it doesn't mean bring everything you can. It means... Do the best with what you have. God has given each and every one of us gifts. God has given each and every one of us abilities. God has given each and every one of us shortcomings as well. And you know why we have shortcomings? So that other people can be there and work with us and support us through those times. But God has given us everything we need. And, and so, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, when Gwen and I, uh, when our kids were growing up, we used to go on trips. And, and we did a lot of trips by car because we used to like to camp and go places and do this kind of stuff. So, so you know, each of us had their, had, had our gifts that we brought because we had two kids in the back seat. You know, you know, are we there yet? Mom, he's looking at me. Dad, she touched my hand. Yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so, so Gwen was always really, really good at being prepared. Uh, Gwen would bring uh, you know, a lot of the things we need. She'd bring snacks. She'd bring pillows. She'd bring blankets. She'd bring drinks. She'd bring the whole thing. I brought duct tape and rope. <laughs> no, I didn't. But I think I convinced our kids that I did. I don't know. But anyway, you know, you you, you make do with what you have. And so, uh, you know, be ready. And when he talks about being ready, he means be ready with how you live your life each and every day. You're on a journey. Take the journey. Enjoy the journey. That's all part of it. How many of you have heard a guy, uh, some of you probably heard this guy, his name is Tom Brady. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know who Tom Brady is. You know, one of the, one of the, the most prolific quarterbacks in, in, in NFL history. And, and so Tom Brady uh, played for uh, Bill Belichick, his coach in New England, for 20 years. And decides, time to retire or time to move on from this team. And, and he ends up going to Tampa Bay. So, so Tom Brady gets to Tampa Bay, and his, his first couple games, it was a bomb. Everybody's expecting, this is going to be great. We've got Tom Brady. We're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. And, and they find out, no, they're not winning. So just a couple weeks into the season, they had a week off, a bye week. And so during that week, Tom Brady and the coach and the team got together and they changed things up. See, here's the deal. Tom Brady was used to working in a system with a coach, with players, and doing things a certain way. But he moved to Tampa Bay and they weren't working that way anymore. So what Tom Brady did, the gift he brought to that team was not only that he had learned certain things, but he was able to unlearn certain things and relearn 
new things. And that's, and that's what our text is asking us to do as well, is to stay alert, to stay on top of things, to be willing to unlearn some of the habits we have, some of the, the presuppositions we have, some of the, the thoughts that we have, to unlearn some of those and to relearn new things as we travel uh, in this life together. But Advent, to th this is a season to me. It's a season of, of warnings, but it's also a season of promise. You know, God, does, God doesn't uh, tell us things without giving us hope for the future, without giving us something to look forward. It's a season of waiting, and it's a season of watching, it's a season of preparation. So, today, I invite you to the journey of Advent. I invite you to the journey of life, not worried about how it's going to end, or where it's going to end, or when it's going to end. We don't have to worry about all that silliness. Instead, let's enjoy this journey of life and, and where we're going. And in, instead of focusing on the negatives that take place, let's focus about, about uh, our efforts on how we live our lives with the time that God has given us and enjoy the journey. And may God bless you this holy day and these holy days before us this season and always. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Take a breath. Sermon's over. I didn't hear Warren say yay. <laughs> Take a breath. Life is good. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for giving us today. Thank you for letting us know that there are tomorrows ahead. Thank you for reassuring us that we don't know how many, but we know that each tomorrow is a gift from you. Help us to not dwell on things of the past and help us to not worry about things of the future, but help us to live in the present, the gift you have given us today, and guide each and every one of us on our journey, that in our journey we may continue to find hope and peace and love and joy. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ who taught us to pray and to pray together often. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
best way to say thanks is to give. And uh, now is our opportunity to, to share what we have. Uh, this church, this family does a lot of, a lot of good things to serve God, and some of them cost money. So um, if y'all would open up.
to invite you to be seated. Today's for Sunday. And we celebrate the birthdays and the anniversaries that have taken place in the month of November. Now, we're not going to have a great big meal, because we've all had great meals this week, right? Right? Yes. All right. We have, we have feasted abundantly. But there is food, there are refreshments, so please, and, and, and you know, even better than the food and refreshments, which are always great here, is the fellowship. The love and the fellowship that we get to share, share with each other. So we do have some November birthdays, and I'm going to read off these names if it's okay with you. I'm going to do it if it's not. But I'm going to read off these names with you for our November birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, and, and when I call your name, you can stand and stay standing if, if you, uh, if you uh, see uh, uh, that appropriate. Paula Frudensprung. There you are. How you doing? All right. Patricia Roten. Charlie, uh, Charlie Sue Davis. Uh, is she cha-cha? She's Chacha. She's Chacha, okay. Uh, Rebecca Marino. Trudelie Strothke. Kennedy Kane. That was just a week ago. Wow. So how's it feel being older? You see you see the game last night? Did you go to the game? No. Aggies were spoilers. But I digress. Let's move on. I was clapping. <laughs> uh, uh, Dottie Schoenberg. Uh, Rob Darville. I know he's here. Uh, William Gilliam Jr., Rory Kane, who's probably not going to stand also. <laughs> I've noticed family issues going on here, but that's okay. Uh, Jerry Lackey and Charlie Davis. Did I miss any November birthdays? All right, excellent. November anniversaries. Candace and Lloyd Kocherek. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir. Yes, sir. 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 Okay. Yes, sir. Candace and Lloyd, you know who they are. <laughs> Jane and Melvin Chimera. Oh, there they are. Look at that. Outstanding. Lauren and Blake Dot. Is it Dazi? Yes. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Okay. And Debbie and Ben Haynes. Did I miss any anniversaries? Now, one of the traditions we have here at the church is that those who have a birthday or an anniversary get to go first <laughs> in the serving line. So, my suggestion will be. Get out of here fast, folks, because the food goes fast. You all know how that is. But if you will, let's stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a story to share with all the world. And the story is joy to the world because the Lord has come. But we're expecting Him to come again in our hearts, in our lives. Christmas is not just a day. Christmas is not a season. Christmas is a way of life. So let us go forth to prepare our hearts and our lives for the coming of the one sent by God. Go in peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 